All right. Can everyone, before I grab the mic, uh, Adam, John, can you all hear me in the back? Yeah. Everybody, the volume's good? All right, awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. How many people were here uh, in November when I did an event at the office uh, back in uh, Fenton? All right, good. So we've got a lot of returns and a lot of new faces. So today what we're going to do is this is going to be the complete opposite direction. When I was with us last time, we did professional empowerment. Today, this is going to be a bit of personal empowerment. I'm going to piggyback off of kind of what John said, because it's not enough to just be good in the office. When you go home, that's where you're going to spend the majority of your day. That's where the majority of your emotional decisions, that's where the majority of your high level success and failures with yourself, with your family, with your spouse, and then you have to come back to work. And if you don't know how to resolve what's at home and handle your personal life, your professional life is going to suffer. We all understand that, we've all seen it, we've all been there. So today what we're gonna do is I am going to take all of you on a trip, literally. I'm gonna take you all back in time, so I'm gonna ask you all this right now. I guess John let us know we can swear, so shit, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> Buckle up, because this story I'm about to tell you is a lot. And if any of you are about to get on an airplane soon, I feel bad for you. So I'm gonna take you all the way back to the end of February, 2019. My wife and I went on a trip. Now she came to me months before that in the summer of 2018 and she said, Adam, I, um, I wanna go on a trip. I said, all right, cool, where are we going? She said, we're gonna go visit my sister. I said, which sister? Because I knew where this was going. She said, the one that's over in Taipei, Taiwan. I said, okay, let's go do that. Now I'm not here to tell you about the vacation, all right? Vacation was awesome, Taipei is amazing. Taiwan is amazing, the people are awesome, the food, the culture, the smell, the sights, everything is phenomenal. I'm here to tell you about the trip home from Taiwan that changed everything about flying, about traveling, about my mindset, and about applying the things that I teach to people into my own life. Now, I gotta start this out by telling you that, I'm not afraid to admit it now, um, I was probably patient zero back in March of 2019 that was the first human that had COVID. I was sick as hell. I don't know what they put in the food, what they put in the water, what they did to me in Taiwan, but I was sick as hell. I had a sinus infection, I had laryngitis and an upper respiratory infection. I had a fever, I had chills. I don't know how they let me go through customs and get on airplanes, I was a mess. Now, coming home from Taiwan, the first thing we had to do was cross the entire ocean. So we're flying from Taipei, Taiwan, all the way into Vancouver. Now, we get to the airport. Remember this, I'm sick. Get to the airport and everything goes well. Check our bags, go through metal detectors, get on the airplane, we're ready to go. All of a sudden, the captain gets on the microphone and says, we are going to remain parked for a while. Apparently, one of the workers dropped somebody's cage with their cat in it, and the cat got loose on the runway in the airport. Now, I thought that was gonna be quick. They'd find it, jingle a bell, do something, but they didn't. Two hours, they looked for this son of a bitch cat. <laughs> Two hours. And now I'm nervous because we had a quick connecting flight already in Vancouver. Now two hours behind, so I know we're gonna be pushed. All right, I'm on the airplane, I'm not feeling good. And by the way, flying is very hard for me because back in 2016, I had a near-death experience. I had a heat stroke. And part of that, I have a physical injury that will remain with me, unfortunately, for forever. I have severe uh, damage to my vestibular nerve canal that runs in the back of my head into my inner ears. So going up at altitude is not comfortable. It feels like vertigo. It feels like the end of the world. It's not a fun thing. And I'm sick. And now we're behind. So now I'm pissed. And we're flying from Vancouver, in, excuse me, from Taipei into Vancouver. And we are an hour and 32 minutes into the flight. I know this because a life-changing experience happened. All of a sudden, the captain gets back on his little... Uh, microphone and he said, all oh, flight attendants return to your seat and buckle up. We're about to experience turbulence. Click. Whew. All right. All right. I can handle this. That's fine. All of a sudden, boom, it felt like a semi truck hit the side of the plane and my body shifts in the seat like this. Now the plane's starting to vibrate like this. People, you can hear them talking in their language. Some people were holding on to a rosary. Babies were crying. It got real tense real quick. The plane started vibrating harder and then all of a sudden we dropped like this and my body started coming up out of my seat like this and we were dropping fast because on the screen I could see it. The altitude was changing in the screen on the back of the headrest and we're dropping and I'm gra I grab onto my wife, the person next to me speaking in some language, I don't know. All of a sudden we come to a stop like we hit the ground, boom. 
the drink carts didn't get secured. They were up in the air while we were coming and they crashed down like this in the back of the plane. Now we're sitting in the back of the plane, hot water, orange juice, cranberry juice, coffee, tea, shit is floating down the aisle. And all of a sudden now we hear people crying. We hear people getting louder and then the plane starts to shake again. And we go through about 10 minutes of life altering turbulence over the Pacific Ocean where we would have never been seen again had this plane gone down. Then we land in Vancouver. And at this point, I'm already upset. I'm literally probably still shaking from this flight. I'm already upset because I know we're behind. And we get in Vancouver and we land and there's ice and snow everywhere and it was starting to snow. I'm like, okay, now we're gonna be stuck here again. Get in Vancouver, we get updated on some information and then we start looking at the weather boards. We start looking at the planes and we start seeing delay, 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 delay. We end up landing in Vancouver that day at 9 a.m. Excuse me, 10 a.m. We landed at 10 a.m. We were supposed to be on a flight at 9 a.m. We ended up landing an hour behind. We didn't get a flight out of Vancouver until midnight that night. Many, many, many hours later. And I'm sick and I'm stuck inside of, a, a hotel, or a, a, of an airport. Get from out of Vancouver, get on an airplane, fly all the way to Toronto. Now this flight, was pretty smooth. We get in Toronto and there's another backup because we ended up being late going into Toronto. Now I'm sitting over at the conveyor belt waiting for my bags to come out. My wife's bag comes out, she picks it up, she walks over, she sits in the seat. And I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there. Well, where's mine? This is, this is fun. And I'm waiting and it um, doesn't show up. So we have to go up to the, to the desk and tell them, hey, I didn't have my bags. Well, they track my bags and they find out that my bags are in Pittsburgh and I'm in Toronto. Not a very good thing. And I am sick. I am coughing. I am sneezing. I am a mess. We end up getting taken over to a different section of the airport and the lady felt so bad for us that she put us up into a hotel. We had a hotel for a night. I had nothing but the clothes that were already on my back. My sickness started to continue to get worse. I was coughing worse. I had a, my fever started to spike while I was in the hotel. Probably should have stopped this trip and gone to a hospital and gotten some medical attention, but I wanted to get home and so did my wife. Then we come back to, you know, we're told to come back to the airport because we have a 9 a.m. flight. They said, be at the airport at 7 a.m. so that you can get your bags. They will be back at the airport, but you'll have to go through some security to make sure that it's yours and to claim everything in there. And we'll have to, we'll have to look at your bags and scan everything. All right, cool, whatever. We get up, get to the airport at 7 a.m. And this is where it gets fun. I go back to the desk. And I say, hey, my name is Adam Ranville. I'm here to get my bags. You uh, somehow sent them to Pittsburgh. I need to get them so I can get on an airplane at 9 a.m. and I can get home because I don't feel good. Gets his little walkie-talkie out, says something to the walkie-talkie. Manager comes over. Manager comes out, come here, come here. And he takes me over to this, this area off to the side. And he starts looking around like this. I thought he was about to tell me a national secret or something that Canada had. And he starts looking around like this. And he's like, all right, so here's what you're gonna do. We got this big blue clock. It's in the middle of the airport. You're gonna to go to this big blue clock and what you're gonna do is I'm gonna give you this little piece of paper. You're gonna walk with this little piece of paper to the big blue clock and you're gonna kind of shake it like this and you're gonna walk in a circle like this around the big blue clock and you're gonna shake your paper. But make sure when you get there, you pop it. You, you, you pop your paper real loud like this is what I'm really being told. And you shake it like this and you're gonna walk in a circle around the clock and somebody's gonna know that you need help to get your bag and they'll come get you. And he walks away. And I'm a dumbass because I didn't ask any questions. Like, is this for real? Is this how you treat just Americans? What's going on here? I didn't ask any questions. So my wife is like, Adam, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm like, I don't care. I want to go get my bag. So we go over to the big blue clock on the other side of the airport. And there's a little seating area over here to the left. And we'll pretend that this is the big blue clock. All right. Now, let me show you what it looks like. This is it right here. I had to take a picture of it. So we get there, she sits down in the seats over here. I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna do this. This is, this is, this is stupid, but I'm gonna do it. And here I go, I get my little paper. <laughs> Don't make me laugh, please. I get my paper, I start shaking it like this. And I start walking in this damn circle around this clock like this. And I'm, I'm making sure I'm, I'm getting a good pop in my paper like this. And I'm walking around like this. And after I do about six or seven laps, I'm like, they're fucking with me. They're recording this. They're going to put this up on YouTube and say this American went crazy in the airport. This, I'm, they're messing with me. So I'm like, oh my God, we're not going to make this flight. I stop and I look over at my wife and she's just shaking her head like this. 
I put this back in my pocket. All right, stay with me. This is the best part. I put the paper back in my pocket, and over by the seat, it's like a couch area. We didn't really pay much attention when we sat down where we were at. All of a sudden, I started hearing this noise. And I stopped and said, I feel like I'm being punked right now. Then it got louder. And this guy, dressed in head to toe safari camouflage gear with the hat on, the beekeeper's net, the whole camouflage outfit, the boots on that are tied real tight so there's no circulation in his ankle. He's probably 6'5", 6 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, 8 foot 12, I don't know, but he's big as hell. And he sits up and my wife quickly jumps up and runs over to me with the whole outfit on and he's making this noise. Takes his hat off and he starts to vomit in his hat. And he's, ah, like he's screaming. While, ah, and he's screaming his vomit into the hat. I can't believe what is happening. Stands up like this is normal shit. Walks over to the trash can, shakes it out, flips it up, puts it back on his head, walks back, and he nods to me and goes back and sits and lays down in his seat. So I got my paper out again, right? All of a sudden, this guy that works there came out of nowhere. He just, pop he might have popped out of the clock. He was there and just, boop, I'm here. And then he's here. Hey, buddy, I heard you needed some help with your bags. Come with me. We're going to go somewhere private. Your wife can stay there. I'm like, oh, sh that already doesn't sound good in, it in itself. All right. So I got a little bit of time. Go in. I get my bag. They scan everything, everything's there, everything that I had is accounted for. They see that there's no bombs or weapons, whatever. It's good to clear customs. I can go into the United States. Then we get our stuff, go back over to the other side of the airport, have to go through the metal detectors, have to go through the scanners and all that. And we get there and the line to get through this whole checkpoint, if you've ever flown through customs and had to do the go swap in and out of borders, they were lined up through the metal detector. That's how many people were there. Don't forget, we had to get a 9 a.m. flight. Finally, weave our way through all this nonsense, get up to the counter. The guy looks at me and he goes, all right, sir, you're, you're not good to go. Where are your two other bags? I said, what two other bags? He goes, I see two other bags over here on your log. You can't fly into the United States until you go clear those off. I said, sir, I have one bag and I've already checked it. It was in Pittsburgh. I'm not going through this again. He goes, I can't let you fly. Now, my wife is already through the gate, already walking to the, to the airplane, and they have to radio her and tell her not to get on the flight because I wasn't allowed to get on this 9 a.m. flight. We get pushed back to 1230. I finally get it taken care of. We get pushed back to 1230, and we finally get on the airplane in Toronto. We get back into Detroit where my parents are waiting, and we land. Go up to the counter, or the little thing where the bags come out, the carousel, my bag comes out. I'm happy, I go off to the side. My wife's bags do not. Now we have to go through this again. Somehow we found out an hour later that Southwest Airlines had taken them and put it in their office and they locked the office for the day. But we ended up getting it out. Got in the car and drove home. Now, this is a lot to deal with, it's funny, you know what, I'm glad we can all laugh because at the time, damn it, it was not funny. But I was sick, I had lost 12 pounds on this vacation, I lost my mind, I was upset, it was rough, it was scary, flying doesn't physically feel good. But I wanna tell you this, why I was able to get through it is because I applied the techniques that I teach people in this situation, particularly gratitude. And here's why. When we were in Vancouver, the reason the flights were being grounded wasn't because of the weather. The reason the flights were being grounded wasn't because of the snow and the ice. When we got in Vancouver, we found out the real reason that a lot of the planes were being grounded. Because at the exact same time that our Boeing 737 MAX 8 was in the air experiencing turbulence over the Pacific Ocean, Another plane that was a Boeing 737 MAX 8 lifted off, off the runway, and this, this plane happened to be Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302. If any of you don't know about the story, at the exact same day on March 10th, when we were up in the air experiencing turbulence, so were they, in the exact same plane. And that plane went on the runway, it went up into the air, spent four minutes in its ascent, had a catastrophic failure in, the, in flight, the plane stopped, took a nosedive, 
and came straight back to the earth, instantly killing 157 people. And at that exact moment when I saw that in Vancouver, my, my mind, my soul said, that could have been us. Nothing else really matters. I get to go home and continue to be sick. I get to go home and see the doctor. My parents get to pick me up. I get to spend more time with my wife. Those people don't. It's a hard story to tell because we were right in the middle of that. And I'm trying to not get emotional about it because I think about it all the time. Like why, were, why did they fail and we didn't? So I implemented gratitude. I implemented tranquility. I implemented thought about my life. And I wanna share with you a couple tactics today when life gets hard. You are going to have difficulty. You are going to have a, a catastrophic fight with your wife or your husband. Your son or your daughter may call you one day at two in the morning and say, hey, I'm in the police station. Your job may stop working and you have to find something else. You might get a terrible diagnosis in your health or the health of the person that you love most. And I'm here today to talk about the, the, the conscious actions the conscious thought patterns, as John had said, and I want to reiterate, that we are programmed into. We are programmed. We are wired to focus on the negative when it gets us nothing. But I want to try and reprogram that with a very specific 30-day tactical to-do list that I want you all to implement into your life, especially right now since it's the beginning of the year, especially since this is the start of the year when you can build that necessary momentum. You can win the first week, then you win the second week, then the third week, then the fourth week, then you've won January, then you've got momentum, you've started a habit, a routine, and a pattern, then you can win February, and oh my God, now I just won two, two months, then you win March and April, and you've won the first quarter, and it builds, and it builds, and it builds, and it builds, and it also helps you when you hit the hurdle when you come up face to face against the wall like I did in a very difficult situation. So if you have pen and paper, get your pens and your paper out because I want you to write these seven specific tactics down and then the program that follows behind it. Uh, if you don't have pen and paper, get your phone out and open up the notes section in your phone or your tablet or your computer, whatever you have, to take notes. And if you want, you can go ahead and take photos of the slides. I'll give you just a quick second for everybody to get ready real quick. All right, so this is, I call it the seven day tactical to-do to list. But in reality, it's really a 30 day tactical to-do list and you'll understand why I'm only starting in a seven day increment first so that you can take something on and not be overwhelmed. When you, anybody in here ever run a marathon, half marathon, a long distance run, anybody ever done that? Okay. Did you win it in the first step? No, you didn't. It was step by step by step by step until you got to the finish line. So I don't want you to be overwhelmed and try to win the entire marathon all at once. That's why over 88% of New Year's resolutions fail. So the first one, the first thing, day one, first day, first tactic on day one, it is spiritual. And what this is, is exactly what I talked about. What you want to do on the first day is you want to create a conscious effort, either write it down, speak it out loud in the form of gratitude and thankfulness and literally take your pen and your pencil and write down all of the wins that you have throughout the day. You woke up, you sat up, you had a bed to sleep in, the hot water worked, the electricity worked, you had food in the refrigerator, the car had gas in it, you made it to work safely, you didn't crash, you didn't die, you have a job, you made money, you came home, the house was still there, win, 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 win. And you write down all of your wins and then you compare it to your losses. Got in a fight with my spouse, got in an argument with my son, um, didn't close the house that day or didn't, didn't make a sale that day. And at the end of the day, after you practice this spiritual practice, you'll see when you visually look at your wins that you have 150 wins and two losses. What's your name right here in the front? Alex. Alex, Alex if I had $150 in my left hand and $2 in my right hand, I said, pick a hand. What are you going to choose? You're going to pick that 150. And guess what he's never going to do? Think about the $2 he missed out on. Now, why is it so damn hard for us to do that in our personal life with our emotions and our wins, which are way more valuable currency than money? So the first thing is going to be spiritual. You're going to consciously write down, focus, and emphasize every win that you have and then be thankful. If you believe in Allah, if you believe in Yahweh, if you believe in God, whatever your spiritual beliefs are, you thank that being, that it, that creator, whatever it is, or yourself, or the universe, whatever works for you, and you be consciously aware and grateful for those wins you have. We all good on that? Day two, mental. 
This is big. Now, this is especially big right now, where there is propaganda, there is blatant media terrorism, there is chaos everywhere right now. This is a little bit different. This isn't about negative or positive thinking. This is about changing out of an emotional state of thought into an accurate state of thought. This is a ma massive, massive difference. COVID is here. Oh my God, I should stay in the house. I'm gonna die, I'm gonna get sick. My whole family's gonna die. I can't, I can't do this anymore. That's an instant emotional thought that gets nobody anywhere, all right? But what you should do is transition into accurate thought. Okay, COVID is here. People are getting sick. What can I do to prevent it? What can I do to make myself healthier? If I get it, what can I do to change the course of that layer of sickness? How many days should I be away from people? And you transition out of emotional-based thinking into accurate-based thinking, because when is the worst time to make a decision? Emotional. When you're emotional, because it never goes in your favor. So you want to transition into a state of accurate mental thinking. Always break it down accurately. Some people will say, I can eat an entire cheesecake today and I'm going to be just fine. That's positive emotional thinking. Well, guess what? You're not gonna be just fine. You're not gonna be just fine if you do that. Accurate thinking would say, if I eat this whole cheesecake today, I will probably be sick. And you're honest, direct with yourself. Very important thing to do. Third day, this kind of speaks for itself. Now more than ever, now more than ever, physical action. Move your ass. Right, John? 75 hard. I watched his journey as he said on Facebook. I love it. Move. You don't have to do 75 hard. Excuse me. You don't have to do 75 hard. You don't have to run a marathon. 30 minutes a day. I don't like going to gyms. I'm scared. Cool. That's fine. Go to your basement. Get yourself a chair. You can do lunges. You can do step ups. You can do tricep dips. You can do push ups and sit ups and jumping jacks, jump rope. You can move your body and get a sweat going. Now, why is that important? Because when you work out, what increases in your body and in your blood? Oxygen. The most powerful steroid on the planet. And especially right now with a respiratory infection going around, the higher your O2 level is, the healthier your body, blood, organs, brain, everything is. Remember this as well with physicality. One molecule of alcohol kills three molecules of oxygen. I'm not here to tell you not to drink, but I'm here to tell you to be conscious about it. All right, move, get physical, get your blood moving, change your wind, get your oxygen levels up because it's good for the body, blood, brain, organs, and everything. We clear on that? Day four, environmental, this is big. Now understand, I understand it's winter, but you can still make this happen, all right? What I want you to do is find some moment of the morning, the afternoon, or the night to consciously and cognitively connect with the earth. Look at the grass, be thankful that you have grass. Look at the bushes, look at a squirrel running by, look at the sun, feel the air coming onto your skin. Maybe you go out and you touch the snow. Physically connect with the environment. There is a process called ionizing. Do any of you know about this? You walk outside with bare feet on grass. It will help ionize your body. What that means is it will help balance the pH and the acidity in your body through the soles of your feet, which are one of the most porous areas on your body. Now listen, I'm not telling you all to go out and get frostbite right now, all right? This is a technique that you can probably do in the spring, summer, and the fall. But walk, in the, walk barefoot in the grass 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes. Allow yourself to connect with the planet, with earth, with life. And if you don't want to in the dead of winter, look out your window, get on your balcony, get on your deck, make sure you have some connecting point with your hands, your feet somewhere. Just touch the snow, touch the grass, look at nature and become connected with your environment around you. It's very, very important to step away from the screens, to step away from TV, to step away from your computer, to step away from your cell phone. We all are now aware of the damage that blue light can do on your retinas and your eyesight. And we're also very aware of the damage that the information on our screens can do to our minds and our emotions. Connect to the planet because the planet is not going to hurt you. Fifth one, emotional. This is big. You need to start doing, on day five, you need to start doing something that brings an emotional reaction to your life in a good way. If it's watching a comedian, if you want to watch uh, reruns of five Dave Chappelle stand-ups, do it. 
humor is good for you. If you want to sit down and listen to a record or a song that makes you cry because it brings heavy emotions on, do it. That's actually good for you. Connect to a puzzle, connect to a workbook, connect to some comics, a comedian, music. Do something that can invoke a strong emotional reaction. Most of our day, we are neutral. We're right here like this, we're not, we're not super crazy wild laughing, and we're also not weeping over in the corner sobbing uncontrollably, right? We're right here neutral, but it's good for your body, for your cortisol, for your adrenaline, your dopamine, your serotonin, your estrogen, your testosterone, to change your body emotionally at least once throughout the day. So do something that helps invoke an emotion in your body. Sixth one is social, and it's literally what you're doing right now. Find a way to be around humans. We were not, there is a reason there's not just one human on the planet. We were put here to connect with other, I'm an introvert, fine. Text, FaceTime, Zoom somebody, get social, find a new person, so wave to someone at the gas station, hey, how you doing? Boom, go back in your car. Do something that makes you connect with another human being. If it be your coworkers, if it be your family, if it be a friend you haven't spoken to in three years, if it be somebody in your life that you have had a relationship with, talk to them, have a conversation, or meet somebody new like some of you have done today. Human interaction is a must. Nobody is meant to be isolated 24 seven. That is bad for the brain, the body, and everything else. And then the final one is internal. On day seven internal. What this means is exactly what you see in the photo. Silence. For at least one hour. No radio, no TV, no cell phone, no emails, no music, no nothing. Get somewhere quiet, get somewhere still, get somewhere peaceful and sit and breathe. Be with your thoughts, be with yourself. Scan your body. Where do you have pain? Where do you have sorrow? Where do you have guilt? Scan your mind, scan your emotions, and sit in silence. You don't have to um for four hours at a time. 60 minutes set aside for silence and go internal. Ask yourself questions. You, you guess what? You cannot lie to yourself, I've tried. It, do, it doesn't work. You cannot lie to yourself. You know the truth of everything. You might have told someone a lie, but you know exactly what the truth is. Sit with yourself and go internal. So this is one tactic every day. So this is how it's going to look right here. The 30 day transformation looks like this. The first day, week one, the first week you're going to do one action a day. So Monday, what's the very first, what's the very first one? Spiritual. spiritual. Monday, spiritual. Tuesday, what's the next one? Mental. Mental. Wednesday, what's the next one? physical, and then Thursday, and then Friday, and then Saturday, and then Sunday, until you get to day seven. Get used to doing one of these actions per day. And then you hit week two, and you're going to do three of them per day. Maybe it's a workout, maybe it's a one hour meditation, and then it's social time, right? Or whatever your three are. Then you're gonna get to week three. You see how this is slowly building, so it's not too much all at once. When you do 75 hard, it is 75 days. It is not 75 days inside one day. It is a slow building process so you can create momentum, and most importantly, so you can start to create a new routine. When you've done a routine for long enough, it becomes what? A habit. When you've done a habit for long enough, you step into what's called hypnotic rhythm. When you are in hypnotic rhythm long enough, which is where you're doing something subconsciously over and over, and you do it long enough, it then becomes a personality trait. And if you're doing something bad, something wrong, something incorrect or harmful, you have probably been doing it for so long that they are now bad personality traits. And you can rewire that by being honest to yourself and being active with yourself. And then you're gonna get all the way down to the fourth week by the end of the month. You're gonna be doing all seven of these a day. It is really not that hard. I do it at every, <clears throat> excuse me, I still do all seven every single day. John, how long have you been done with 75 hard? Two weeks. You still working out every day? Yeah. All right, because it became, a, it became a routine. Then it turned into a habit, then it turned into a rhythm, and sooner or later it's gonna become a personality trait <laughs> that John is gonna try and make all of you start working out probably or if he hasn't already done that. We already did that. We already did that, all right? And then you're gonna build all the way through 30 days. And, that, and then at day 31, 
Maybe you change it up, maybe you change the, the, the process up, maybe you start with your workout, end with meditation, whatever the case may be, but you implement these seven tactics throughout the day. They're not gonna make you bulletproof. They're not gonna make you unshakable. You're going to cry. Somebody in your family is going to get sick. Someone in your family at some point will pass away. Something bad is going to happen to you and it will happen to me. But when you have a core foundation of principles and discipline that you can lean back on, you can acknowledge the hard time, go through the emotions and the pain, and then be able to come back into the world so that you can continue to be with yourself, your wife, your husband, your children, your boyfriend, girlfriend, and you can continue to work on yourself and move forward. The worst thing a human being can do is stalemate. That's when you commit spiritual suicide. So before I go any further, are there any questions on the seven things we talked about? Any feedback, any questions, anything at all? We're all pretty clear and straightforward on that. And then I want to finish with this right here. I've said it before and I want to say it again. None of this matters unless you ask this question to yourself right here. None of this matters. You love what John said. Maybe you love what I said. You're going to love what Sean has to say. You might enjoy all of it. But are you interested or committed? An interested person loves it in the moment and they'll say, yeah, I can make that happen. And then they will make excuses and then try to justify why those excuses are acceptable. A person that is committed will do it no matter what. So you must ask yourself that question. Are you interested or committed? Are you interested in making $20,000 more this year? than you did last year or are you committed to it are you interested in dropping the 35 pounds that you can't stand in your midsection or are you committed to it are you interested in finally being in a good relationship or are you committed to finding that <clears throat> you must ask yourself that question now before I leave real quick we do events ourselves. I just want to ask one quick ask of everybody. If you could get your phone out, follow us on Instagram. We do bi-monthly events just like this all around the state, all around Southeast Michigan. Follow us, our company's Main Street Meetup. I'll leave that up here. Uh, join us. We had a great event in January. I would love to see some of you at an upcoming event to continue this training and this education. Follow us on Instagram, Main Street Meetup. Before I take off here, uh, I don't know where they went. Uh, can we give a round of applause to Todd for helping put this together? I want to shout some people out. Can we give Todd a round of applause for this? Now, secondly, can we give a round of applause to John and to Christian for helping put this on? And then lastly, I want to thank all of you and I want you all to give a round of applause to the most important human being in the room and that is yourself. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you. I enjoyed today. I look forward to seeing you all and working with you all again soon. I am forever grateful. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>